Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk. I am Sadiq Ali Kutumaran. Do not even try my last name. So many syllables for most of you. I am a software engineer at Braintree. I also happen to be SDQ Ali on most of the internet. Although there is a competition between an Indonesian teenager named Sadiq Ali and me as to who get to use the name SDQ Ali. So invariably on the internet, if you see SDQ Ali, it's me, but sometimes you will see an Indonesian teenager who is not me named SDQ Ali. So today I'm here to talk about clearly, okay, here. Back. So today I'm here to talk about implementing a GraphQL API at Braintree, uh, some of the challenges that we ran into, and some of the lessons that we learned. It's a 30 minute talk, so I won't, be go I won't be able to go into everything, but I'll be able to cover most of the important things. So we are Braintree, and Braintree is the payment platform of choice for your favorite applications and services. So if you book an Uber ride or order delivery from your favorite restaurant, that payment goes through us. So at Braintree, GraphQL is part of our ongoing effort to digital, well, a marketing person clearly wrote this slide. And so I'm going to just try and do justice to it, right? So at Braintree, GraphQL is part of our ongoing platform's digital transformation, which will allow us to deliver an always improving developer and online consumer experience. I believe in the second part. I don't quite believe in this particular sentence, the way it is written, but it's okay. Right? So our API is available to you at graphql.braintreepayments.com. You can go there, sign up for a sandbox account, and do all the cool things that you know how to do with a GraphQL API. So we are a company that takes a lot of pride in our SDKs. Our software development kits allow our merchants to integrate fast and start accepting payments. Because if you are a merchant, you don't really care about the fact that, oh, you know, Sadiq wants to write GraphQL API, right? You want to be able to accept payments. That's all you care, you care about. So we take a lot of pride in our SDKs. We put a lot of love and care into it. And in turn, our merchants love our SDKs. This is basically kind of a representative diagram of what we are dealing with. Right? We have a bunch of SDKs, which most of our merchants use. We have an API layer, and we have Braintree services of various flavors and capabilities spread across the globe that use different stacks, different protocols to talk. And then we have this large number of third-party systems that we have no control over. And if you have even a cursory familiarity with the payments domain, you would know that that part that I have shown in cloud is really like a wild, wild west. I want to start by reminding everybody that there are no absolutisms here, right? This is a talk about how to layer GraphQL API on an already existing, very successful API and get it to run alongside that successful REST API. We heard yesterday from a lot of people who had the opportunity, opportunity to build their entire system from ground up with GraphQL in mind. For example, we heard from the wonderful team at Audi about how they were able to apply the principles of CQRS all through their platform with the idea that eventually the consumers of their API are going to access their API through GraphQL. I believe that we come, it, we come at this problem from the other side of the spectrum. These things have worked for us. There is no guarantee that it will work for you. But my hope is that you would see patterns that you could potentially adapt. So why GraphQL? As you can, as you can see, right, we, we work in the payments domain. And a lot of our merchants are very tech savvy, right? They happen to be technology companies themselves, or companies where technology is at the very forefront of what they do, right? So we take a lot of pride in our SDKs and integrations, right? And most of our merchants use them. But some of our merchants want direct integration 
because they want fine-grained control over the experience that they are in turn providing to their end customers. Obviously, GraphQL allows them to do that because these APIs that we have today were not written with direct integrations in mind. They were written with SDKs in mind. Most of our merchants provide their end customers mobile experiences that are snappy, fast, and, we, and our merchants want to use less bandwidth, right? So we always hear this, right? GraphQL allows you to choose your own payload. And we have a lot of merchants who are at this point where they want to control the payload that they receive and transport between the payment gateway and the user's mobile phone application. We want our merchants to be able to build faster integration using interactive tooling. Interactivity and the ability to introspect is at the core of what GraphQL does, and that made it a great fit for us. We also want to be in a position where we can evolve our APIs really fast without breaking a lot of things. I'll take a moment to talk about technology choices. All right. So if you have been paying attention, in the last couple of days, there is a Twitter thread that, go, that can be kind of summarized as this, right? which is that GraphQL exists only because JavaScript people are too much in love with JSON. I'm not going to go into that. I'm not a JavaScript person, and we are not really a JavaScript shop, but make of it what you will. Our API, our API gateway uses Java, right? But that does not mean that we are going to write report edge resolver factory, right? There are ways to do this in Java without having to write Java. So we don't have any of those. So these are our technology choices, right? As we started our journey along this path, we looked at the tools that were available at that time. And we are probably the only people up on this stage who don't use Apollo. Maybe, maybe that will change, but we didn't, right? We, took the GraphQL Java library, mostly because we want to be able to write this GraphQL API alongside our existing REST API, because it's very important to us that our existing merchants who have integrated with us continue to receive the same care and attention and our thought to the REST API till they migrate. We also happen to use the Java implementation of Facebook data loader to improve query efficiency. And eventually, we moved to GraphQL Java tools because we wanted to eliminate some of the boilerplate that we, were end up, we ended up writing. If we were to make this decision today, maybe we will choose a different stack. We don't know. But I would definitely say that, looking back, the learnings for our team from implementing the framework on top of these things was very important because now our team understands GraphQL. One of the first decisions we had to make was that as we, as we were onboarding more and more teams to our API, we realized that we were representing our schema in an ideal file, right, an interface description language file. And that file was growing really fast. Right? You can imagine we, being in the payments industry, expose a lot of capabilities to our merchants, which obviously are developed by a large number of teams. So our schema file was growing fast, and we had to decide how to organize our schema. So we considered splitting our schema along domain boundaries. Right? So some of, the, some of the domains that are very obvious in our industry are cards, tokenization of cards, reporting, merchant data, so on and so forth. We soon discovered that if we were to split along this line, we would end up with a common file. Right? And as you know, Util and common are where things go to die, right? If you have any kind of util or common, this is where you end up dumping things that you don't frankly want to think a lot about. Right? So we didn't want that. So we decided to split along GraphQL concepts. Now, this may be a departure from some of the advice and success stories that you have heard on stage today, right? And I want to remind everybody that this works for us. And it works for us because it gives us very cleaner boundaries it has less duplication. It makes it easier for our developers to go and figure out 
where the schema is composed from. The next decision point that we arrived at was whether to make our API relay, co relay compliant or not. So for those of, who, those of you who are not familiar with it, relay is a specification on top of GraphQL. It can be summarized as a set of assumptions that a client is willing to make about its GraphQL server. There were some things that we really liked in Relay, right? So we really liked the fact that Relay enforces consistent input structure. We liked the fact that Relay forces you to formalize connections and paginations and query efficiency. We like the fact that Relay talks about identifiers and the ability to refetch objects in your system given an identifier. So overall, we think that Relay gave us a guiding principle, and we decided to adopt some of these things. Of course, you know, stories can't always end great, right? So this forces us to think about global IDs, right? So Relay kind of dictates that given an identifier, without knowing anything about that entity, you should be able to fetch it. Right? And obviously, our REST API did not care about global IDs, because if you look at these examples, you would know that if you look at the first URL, which can be used to close an open transaction, that identifier WV3E, I'm not going to say the rest, but you get the idea, that has meaning in our system only so far as it lies in the context of the transaction, right? It has no meaning outside that URL. Similarly, for the second example, that identifier is meaningful to our system only if it is in the context of a merchant, right? It works well, right? So you, could, you can think of the REST API contextualizing your identifiers. Obviously, we will not have that ability when we are moving to GraphQL. So we had to confront this and ask ourselves, so how are we going to have global IDs in a system like ours, right? So we always had to think about the format of it, right? What does, what does a global identifier look like for an ID that could be dealing with any entity in your system? Eventually, we settled on URL safe base64 encoded strings. Uh, we also had to think about how does our legacy systems and our existing REST API deal with the presence of this new global ID? So the way we approach it is our legacy backend systems that the consumer doesn't get to see now adds a global ID with every entity that it returns. And at the API layer, we decide what to do with it. So our GraphQL layer obviously passes it on to the client, deals with, deals with it when the client is asking for that entity. And our REST API doesn't care about it. So we also want to point out the fact that we came to the decision that certain entities in our API will not have global identifiers. Now, that may seem strange because we went into the effort of trying to do a lot of the things that, no, that Relay uh, talks about, right? And it turned out great for us. But we, are, we have certain requirements that we, are, we, I believe, are not willing to go beyond, which is that for example, if you are a merchant, there is no business if you are a merchant to even think about accessing somebody else's data. So there are, there are entities in our system that do not conform to global IDs. That, you could say, make us non-compliant with Relay. The next issue that we had to deal with, like everybody else who has ever tried to take a GraphQL system to production, is how to deal with query complexity, right? If you are not careful, it is very easy to build a GraphQL system that is an invitation for people to perform a denial of service on your system. The approach we ended up taking was that we always compute the complexity of a particular query or mutation on the fly. We assign complexity factor to every entity that can participate in a potential output. And we reject, we reject calls that exceed the threshold through instrumentations. The next thing I want to look at is API visibility, right? 
So what does it really mean for us when we talk about API visibility? The ability of GraphQL to provide you introspectability and the ability for people to interact with it is great, right? It allows you to conveniently expose your APIs without doing anything, right? You, your schema is your documentation, if you will. Now, is that always a good thing? In our experience, it is not necessarily a good thing. So I want to be very clear here that I'm not really talking about authorization, right? We are talking about whether a particular client should even know that this schema has other capabilities that it has no business dealing with. In our case, we are very clear about certain things, right? which is that we have server-side integrations, we have client-side integrations, we have administration panels, so on and so forth. We want to make it very, very clear that the server-side integrations should not even know that there is a particular capability that a client-side integration has access to, and vice versa. And you can imagine what an admin panel would feature in this conversation, right? We want certain capabilities that are visible only to admin panel. And, and I want to stress the fact that it's, it's not like certain capabilities that can be executed by admin panel. These capabilities are not even visible to other consumers. So the way we do it is that we always build the schema dynamically. So this is a theme that you have heard in a lot of, lot of talks here on stage which is that you always have to build your schema for the current request for the current user who is presenting an authentication token. So building the schema late for every request allows us to look at it and say, this type of consumer is a server-side integration, so we are going to build the schema in such a way that the other side of the API is not visible to them. Which brings us to authorization, right? They are kind of related. In our REST world, authorization is pretty clear, regardless of what technology stack you use or what, your, what language you use, you end up with something like this, right? You have a function or method, as you might call it, producing a response which is mapped to a URL pattern, which in turn gets mapped to a set of rights or roles that has to be present on the credential that is being presented. So if you, if you look, look at our API, our most long-lived REST APIs, people had a long time to think about this, right? People arrived at the conclusion that, hey, this is a good way of doing it and works most of the time. Now, in our GraphQL world, uh, let's look at this example query. This is not a real query, right? I made this up. So let's say you have a query to get fetch panel data, and panel data consists of transactions which succeeded. And let's say there are failures that are transactions that we want only admin users to see, right? Now, we could take the same approach we took in the REST API, which is to say that the moment you receive a panel data query, you can ascertain that a panel data query consists of things that only an admin have access to, right? You could reject the entire query. Now, we didn't want to do that. We, we wanted to put our merchants in a place where if they make a GraphQL query, they will get the results of all the operations that, have, that they have the right to execute, right? So for us, that meant that we had to forward all the requests that a client could see into their downstream systems, and then let the downstream systems decide whether it needs to succeed or not. And if the downstream system decides that it needs to fail, our GraphQL layer would aggregate the errors, if the downstream system decides that this is good to go and it produces a valid output, we would pass it on to the client. So you can think of it as partial successes, which brings us to designing for partial successes. In our world, and in, you know, and in the worlds of the systems that most of you are building, there is no guarantee of any downstream action reliably succeeding. And it is especially true in our world where this is what kind of what we are building, right? So we have the GraphQL API that talks various protocols to various brain tree owned systems, which in turn talk to systems owned by third parties living across the world. You know, third party systems could go down. Two third party systems could go down at the same time. Worse, your own systems could go down. So for us, 
there is no guarantee that we will be able to serve a particular field, that we will be able to resolve a particular field. So that forces us to be comfortable serving nulls. Now, comfort, being comfort, comfortable ser serving nulls in the GraphQL, GraphQL world means that the fields of your output types have to be nullable. This is also a theme that you would have heard in a lot of conversations here, which is that your output fields have to be nullable, especially if you are trying to build a GraphQL API on top of an existing API while keeping things working for the existing consumers. Some people may have the luxury of fields that are not nullable in outputs. If you have those, you should say thanks. We don't have that luxury. And we have learned to look at it as a success, that we, all, we have output fields that are nullable, and we won't be able to resolve them. Our response to that is to be careful about collecting all the errors, aggregating all the errors, and forwarding it to the client. Which brings me to error handling. So over the years, we at Braintree had a consensus in our entire system as to how errors are represented, right? So this used to be a rough structure of our error, right? Our clients understood this. Our SDKs understood this. Our monitoring systems understood this. Our developers understood this. Our documentation understood this. Now, more importantly, you could lean back on the HTTP status code to communicate nuances in errors. And with, that, with, you know, with GraphQL, that nuance is gone, right? Everything is 2xx. So if you look at the previous representation, you can see that in every response, we want to be able to represent multiple errors, right? We want to support legacy error codes because the legacy error codes are important to us. We have merchants depending on it. More importantly, in GraphQL, the errors are not introspectable. So we think that error handling in GraphQL deserves some love from the community. And there is a lot of conversation about it, there are a lot of positive conversations about it. But I think that if we think of GraphQL as the thing it is, which is the future of API development, then I, th I think we need to invest more time and love in coming up with a better strategy to deal with errors. So if you look at this, right, this is a sample error from our system. Uh, we have a list of errors for this. We have a message, which is pretty clear what it is. We have locations. Now, locations is interesting, right? That location is talking about the place in the resolved query where an exception happened. That's not really useful. At least, at least we believe it's not useful. If you are finding that useful, I'd like to talk to you and learn from you. Uh, we have the path. The path denotes the place in the query where the error happened. But wouldn't it be awesome if you could point the path to the place in the deep nested structure of your input and tell that this is where the error happened? And then we have extensions, right, where we throw in a lot of legacy error codes. Again, there is no typing associated with it, right? There is no typing associated with it. The errors are not introspectable. And we find that errors end up being dumping ground for untyped data, right? In a system, and in a technology that focuses so much on getting your schema right, thinking about types, you know, carefully selecting the type of things that you want, and why, why are we okay sending untyped string in errors, right? So I believe, I, be, I believe that the strength of GraphQL is in defined types, right? Types are very important. That's, that's why we are here. Without, without, if GraphQL was not a typed system, we wouldn't all be sitting here. I, I personally believe that, right? So I, I, I believe that we need to extend that same thought into error handling. So one of my colleagues, Corey, has written out a proposal to solve some of these issues, right? Obviously, nobody is going to solve it in one day. Nobody is going to solve it in one RFC. So you may not agree with everything that is in the RFC, but it's on uh, GraphQL's. GitHub page, so I would encourage all of you to go there and have a conversation, right? Even if you completely disagree with the particular approach, I believe that all of you having the conversation will help us improve error handling as a community. The next thing that we found interesting while 
writing our GraphQL API was the team workflow, right? As I mentioned before, we have a lot of capabilities being developed by teams that are geographically distributed, distributed along you know, reporting structures and domain boundaries and budgets and so on and so forth, right? Now, as people are trying to contribute to this API, we ended up in a really interesting situation, right? So we have an API team who are the custodians of the schema, right? So they're always playing this balancing act because they're, all, they're acting as the custodians of the API, making sure that your schema is right, your API makes sense for merchants. But then you have, on the other side, a product team who want to put a new cool feature in the hands of the merchant, right? So we found that this wasn't really working till we decided to address it, which is that we found that the collaboration needed for creating a large-scale GraphQL API Pardon for the word scale. Um, maybe I should say a GraphQL API of large scope. Is that the schema changes become very important. And if you have like 16 teams contributing to the schema, we found that the only way we could get it right was forcing people to propose schema changes without being tied into the implementations of how you are going to do a particular resolver. Right? So we always encourage people to submit pull requests where the resolver doesn't do anything, but it, it presents the new schema as the team would desire it. And then we would have conversations about it, and the conversations are now focused on the schema and getting it right because you are no longer tied in the intricacies of how your resolver or data fetcher is going to work. Because you know, as we know, right? As developers, we all, we all like having like really long conversations around PRs, right? We all like it. If you don't, you are a, you are a good person. Uh, thank you. Pe people, you know, people like using uh, PRs as slack, if you will, right? So separating the change in the schema with the change in the implementation allows you to focus on the schema, which, is, which, you know, which if you are the custodian of an API, is very important to you, right? That is what your merchant sees. That is, go, that is what is going to dictate the experience that your merchant has. Which brings me to my last point, which is to focus on the schema. Again, we may be departing from a lot of the advice and patterns that you have seen from other people, where people are OK with the idea that your schema will slowly evolve, and you have to be comfortable with it, right? And I think that works when you are building things bottom up with the assumption that you are going to serve everything to GraphQL. For us, that doesn't apply, because we have to keep supporting things, right? We are trying to put GraphQL on, you know, for a lack of better, a very successful API, right? And so we believe that getting the schema right is important in a situation like ours. Getting the schema right is worth investing the team's time on. And a schema, just like anything in software, you can get it right even there are multiple people and teams involved in only through discussions, right? GraphQL or any kind of APIs or software, building it ultimately is about the people who participate in the building, right? Or maybe 20 years down the line, some AI would generate it, but today it is about the people. And so there is no substitute for like open communication between teams, uh, not, just, not just between the custodians and the, and the product teams, but between the custodians, the API teams, and different API teams. I want to end by reminding all of us, including me, that an effort like what we did at Braintree does not happen because of one or two or three people, right? It takes like hundreds of people to create an API that exposes the kind of capabilities that we want our merchants to have access to, right? And yet, like one or two people come on the stage and talk about it, like me today. So I want to thank all the people at Braintree who contributed in thought, in code, in review, whatever form that may be, to our GraphQL API. I specifically want to thank certain people. So I want to thank Miriam, Luke, Corey, Alex, Tom, and Drew for the time they spend, the attention that they put into it, and their thought about GraphQL. Some of them are here. If you run into them, say hi. Finally, I want to thank all of you for spending your afternoon listening to me. 
I hope you got something out of it. I certainly did because just having this conversation made me think about the things, I, things we did, and I find that a net positive. I also want to uh, tell people that I really value feedback, and I really act on feedback. So if you have feedback on any aspects of my talk, I will listen to you and I will thank you. Thank you for coming. You have a nice evening. <laughs>